Hello, uh, uh, good to be with uh, uh, Amiro and Joel and Linda today. Uh, we're all out in the San Francisco Bay Area. I pastor uh, Petaluma Valley Baptist Church, and uh, I've, I've gotten to know these folks over the years. Uh, uh, Linda, I've known for over 20 years through church planning work and uh, things like that in the San Francisco Bay Area, and I've been able to meet Amaro and Joel uh, just in the past uh, couple of, of uh, months uh, as, as fellow pastors here in the Bay Area and, and just want to have a conversation about what immigrant churches um, are, are, are going through uh, from a lot of different perspectives. Uh, Linda uh, Berquist works with uh, the North American Mission Board as a church planner catalyst for uh, the San Francisco Bay Area and for Northern California, and uh, Amaro is a pastor pastor of Iglesia Batista La Roca, and uh, Joel is pastor of Iglesia Batista El Calvo, El Calvo Rio, right? Okay, uh, sorry, I got tongue-tied there, and they are both in the Bay Area. Amira, uh, what city are you in? Uh, we are in Hayward, in Hayward? the heart of the Bay Area, yeah. Okay, and so that's the uh, uh, the East Bay, and, um, and then Joel, uh, what city are you in? We are in Redwood City. Redwood City, so that's the peninsula south of south of San Francisco. And then, Linda, you live in in San Francisco, in the south part of the city, and 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 I'm up in Petaluma, which is uh, 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 the south part of Sonoma County in San Francisco North Bay. And so uh, we're just having a conversation um, about what's happening here. So I would, um, I wanted to ask you. Uh, uh, I can ask all three of you, and whoever wants to jump in can. But uh, as 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 pastors and as church leaders working with immigrant and refugee populations what are you seeing happening right now especially in the midst of a coronavirus how is how is the virus and the um the attendant uh, uh government uh, uh, shutdown to combat the virus how is this affecting your congregations and the, the people that you work with well for, for us it has had a great impact i'm getting a sense that people losing their jobs is always going to impact uh most of our people are are low income. Uh, uh, first of all, I don't know how people can afford to live in this area, but now with no job, it's even more difficult. So, you know, as a church, we're trying to just encourage them. Um, me as a pastor, of course, we continue our services, but it has it has had a great impact and the, on them, especially. For those who are non-English speaking, uh, now that their children are in-house in doing online schooling, that's a big challenge uh, for the parents, adding even more stress. Now with the children being in-house, well, even if you had jobs, now one of them has to stay home. <laughs> so in, in living in this area, you pretty much need both incomes to kind of survive. So it, it, it's affecting quite a bit. Amazingly, uh, I think most of them are holding on okay emotionally, you know, uh, but it has had a great impact on so, uh, a lot of our people. Uh, good thing uh, jobs have been opened this week. So that's gonna be a little bit better for most of them, but uh, the, on the emotional side, it has taken a lot of work uh, from us as pastors to try to encourage and um, keep them hopeful. I think this is where we know that our faith really plays a big, big role, you know, because amazingly, uh, just about every member that I talk to, they're at peace, a little worried, yes, <laughs> mostly for their children uh, more than anything else. But that's been our experience at this point, uh, maybe later on you might want to, or, or I don't know if you want to ask how we're doing to help him out. Yes. <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. but yeah, but uh, at this point, uh, the emo emotional side is a big thing, which that's where our faith comes in. And I think it has proven that our faith does conquer the world. Mm. Yeah. Very good. What about you, Amaro? What are you seeing in uh, Hayward? Yeah. In our case, it's pretty much the same, but um, in our case as a church, uh, we have around 25 families. And um, out of those 25 families, three of this, them, uh, they got the, the virus, somebody from the family. In, in some cases, two members of the family, they got the virus. So 
they have to stay in quarantine for three weeks, two, three weeks. And that is hardest for them because some of them, they lose the job. Uh, some of them, they are in the process to get the documents um, as a resident. So they're not allowed to get the uh, government support. Uh, so the income is very low. The main thing is, I think, the, the financial issues, especially for a half of this congregation. Many of them, they, they are only mom. They, the family sees only the mom. The mother is a charge of, of three or four kids. So the main issue besides the health is the financial issues. But um, as a pastor, so we don't have experience on all these things that we have right now, but at least we can um, try to help them as much we can as uh, in the spiritual area and uh, financial to try to get in some uh, help aids or uh, you know, uh, funds for them and uh, praying, be in contact with them. Uh, so that's the part that we are doing. But um, one of the good things is uh, we have communication between the congregation, but text messengers to texting, pray each other, talking. Uh, so that is a good thing to, to support each other, to love each other, to keep praying for us. So um, it's not easy, but uh, we are there trying to keep as much we can. Uh, so um, that's the hardest things, the financial, the health, and uh, no income at, at home, uh, losing the jobs, all those things. What is the percentage of your, are, are most of your folks online? Are they able to access online content or is it mostly uh, phone calls and text messages? Do you know? Yeah, well, the service we are uh, keeping by face, Facebook, okay. Wednesday and, and, and Sundays. Uh, but uh, besides that, we, we, we communication is by text messengers and, and, and calls, okay. yes. Okay. What about you, Linda? You work with a lot of uh, church planners and pastors and churches across across the uh, Northern California. What are you seeing and hearing from your folks of, of, of different backgrounds? Yeah. Well, with different immigrant um, populations, it's looking different. Like immigrants that are um, working in a high tech field, some of them are actually working with experiments on the coronavirus. Um, and if they are in the tech business, oftentimes they're working at home and they're keeping their jobs. Um, but they're engaged in the whole process in different ways than we can imagine. Um, but there are other um, different immigrant populations that are having a much more difficult time. Since the Bay Area was really the first place that shut down, one of the things that I saw was that um, in th that not every immigrant community has local news in its language, and they were really scared. And I had people calling me up thinking they couldn't leave their house for any reason. They said, we don't have any food. We don't know what to do. We can't go outside. We don't know where to get a face mask or what kind of face mask was good enough. So all of those things, because they didn't have, um, they just didn't have news in their own language. And that, that and now that, that now they can get, they can get, for instance, they're in Nepal, they can get news about what people are doing there and they have more translatability at first. That was really hard. Another um, kind of population that's having a difficult time are um, a lot of the, the Muslim immigrant population I know here in the Bay Area. One of the they have gig work, like um, Uber driving, um, Lyft driving, etc. And that's basically not going to exist. And people who don't want to get in a car and be less than six foot away from a driver, so they're not taking that kind of transportation. If they are going to work at all, they'd rather walk to work. And and so a lot of the gig workers have lost their job. And that kind of adds to some of the problems going on with gig workers already. Anybody who gets 1099 is having a difficult time in California anyhow. Um, and then another population I'm seeing um, that is addressing this is students, international students. And so the school closes down, the dormitories close down and they have no place to live and they don't know what to do. And um, so they've had to go back home again not all of them have been able to afford a plane ticket and um, their families haven't been able to just send them back home again so they had to find other places to live and that's been really hard on the international student population as well uh, there are just a lot just a lot of versions of that 
And so um, with what they're going through, uh, all of you are encouraging or, or, or helping in, in a, a meeting needs and a serving. You know, one thing I've been saying for a long time and trying to encourage uh, um, pastors and churches uh, in America, we kind of have this sometimes, is, and perhaps it's unintentional, but, but maybe kind of a two-tiered perspective where you have um, the native-born uh, pastors and churches, um, you know, whether they be Anglo or whether they be African American or or whatever it might be that are here, and that's kind of seen as primary. Then immigrant pastors and churches are are seen um, as secondary in the sense of of oh, it's the job of the of the of the native born churches to minister to or help the immigrant churches. But the reality is, we're full partners in and what God is doing, we're equal, we're exactly the same, and we can help each other, and we can, uh, you know, help our own folks. We don't, uh, it's good to partner, it's good to share our resources, definitely, but, but, um, you know, but it isn't that one needs the other more than the other needs, you know, each other, so that type of thing. So, so what are you guys doing? How are you um, helping take care of your people, and how are you ministering? What are some things uh, that you're doing where, and and then maybe ways that you're working with other churches too uh, throughout this to help support and encourage. In our case, we have a team of people uh, identifying the needs in the families, which that's been very helpful. Uh, that way I don't have to do all the calling, even though I call the families as much as they can, but not necessarily to identify the needs, but to give them encouragement and pray for them. But there's a team, uh, specifically to identify needs and ask those questions that, uh, 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 you know, th these are a team of people who have been in church for 15, 20 years. So they're very highly trusted by the members. At this point, probably more than me. I've only been there three years. So, <laughs> so it, it's a very strategic team that reaches out to the families at, to specifically identify needs or families who are in need some may not say they need anything but when we know that none of them are working we just have to know there's needs there these are not people who make millions of dollars a year so they probably live by month and when both of them are laid off most likely there's needs so those are families we are identifying again for years i don't know how long the church has been uh, picking up a love offering uh, on, right after the Lord's Supper. And that's been very beneficial, huge uh, help for the families. We started with a small stimulus, we can call it the Calvary stimulus package for the families. Uh, we are able to open it up a little bit more uh, for those families who are probably beyond the need of the average needs in the church. Uh, so we have set aside some funds uh, to give family financially to buy things that food banks will not give them. Like most of our families have a lot of children, like Cometa was saying. Uh, amazingly, we, we have families in our church that have five, six children. <laughs> so, and, and most of them are 10 years and under. So uh, for children, there's a lot of other needs besides food that they need, uh, especially for the little ones. Uh, and food banks most likely will not give you that. So we're being sensitive to those needs of, of, of the families, which is, we also have a prayer meeting every single night, seven days a week, which we have been holding since this started. And uh, that's where we bring up prayer request and when some of the needs will probably come up somebody may know of a family that nobody was able to identify it so they bring it up we don't just pray for them but we send somebody out there to the door you know and uh, taking all the precautions and and try to supply those needs as as much as we can we can't supply every need but i think we're supplying the basic ones and the most essential needs at this point which God is so gracious and he's been so good to us. So mm. uh, we never know <laughs> that God is, we never knew God was preparing this fund for this. You know, I, I know a few months back we said, what are we going to do with this fund? Because hardly nobody uses it. Nobody was in need. Well, now we know why God allowed this fund to 
grow to this point that we can help families. Mm -hmm. And even families who are not members of our congregation, we encourage our families, if you know a need in your families around you, neighbors, friends, that they have a need, please let us know. We want to reach out to them. We don't want to be selfish. And if there's a need, we want to reach out to them. Very good. So you're helping people even outside of your congregation uh, with other situations. It's, it's, yeah. It's important. yeah. What about you, Joel? Is it, it, um, it, it, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Amiro, I meant to say. Um, it, it, is that basically the same thing that you're doing or uh, yes. some additional things? Yeah, basically the same. Basically the same. In, in, uh, we have, uh, we have uh, families from uh, Central America and they don't most of them, they don't speak English. They don't know how to fill up some uh, documents to get some funds from the city or from the county or something like that. So we are, um, besides praying and be with them in emotional areas, we try to help them how to do all those requesting from uh, the, the city or county. Um, and uh, also we uh, try to get in some funds to help like brother uh, Jimenez says to to create a, a little stimulus package to, to share with them. We have uh, around 10 uh, critical families that we more uh, focus on them because we know they don't have income for pay the rent and uh, for another uh, expenses. So we try to get some uh, funds for them. And uh, thanks God because other churches, other people, they, they uh, are helping us to, to uh, support these families. So it's a blessing to have another churches um, uh, help us in, in that area. Uh, so that is the, the, the main support that we are doing to connect with another uh, agencies where they can help them or getting food or getting some funds. Yeah. And uh now, Linda, you had mentioned uh, before, I want to kind of take a little bit of a different angle with you, and then maybe um, if Amaro and Joel can speak to this as well. But as, as we're all going through this, and uh, I, I, was, I was really interested um, to hear the way uh, uh, Joel uh, framed this, but the way that his church is helping other people, but even thinking about the people in our churches and the immigrants um, in, uh, in the Bay Area um, and then throughout California, too, who are helping uh, or who are, are working um, in agriculture and helping the food supply continue, who are working in, in the tech field, working in, in medical care, all, all of these things. How are, how are you seeing your own folks in, in your congregations and, and people in, in churches um, who come from an immigrant or refugee background, how are they helping keep, keep things going um, and, and helping everyone else as well? Yeah, um, so um, my husband has worked for many years with homeless populations and one of the things we've learned um, by doing that is that everybody has something to give and everybody has something to receive. And there might be different kinds of things. But um, for example, um, Pastor Hoel's daughter was able to help a Caucasian older man who needed to know how to get online and how to set up a giving platform online, how to actually do that in his church. She had that to give to him. Um, I have an, another um, <clears throat> gentleman um, in the Poly Church that um, we've been able to help with finances, but he's reaching out and he's actually helping Paul. And he does every, every morning at 5 a.m., he gets up and does a Zoom call, something like a Zoom call, whatever, with people in the churches in Nepal who need prayer and need care. Um, there's... Um, a man from a, a, a Chinese church, a young man who's who helped an older pastor from an older established Chinese church um, to also to get online and know how to do church that way. I think that there's a, um, a, I'm finding that there are two ways churches are responding. One is they're becoming better at being local and the other is they're better at becoming global. And so sometimes they need help in being local, but then they help the existing churches are even helping very large churches know how to maybe change, change their understanding of mission so that they're reaching out to the world. A, a, a church that hasn't even started yet, that is a, a Chinese um, Mandarin speaking church that's reaching out to Shanghai, um, a, um, uh, an Indian church that's reaching out into India. 
and the and and also an Indian church in India that's giving back to them and helping to be a support for them as well. Um, so that that give and take it doesn't always have to be in the same realm, but allowing everybody. When Jesus sent out the seventy, he sent them without anything, and he said, um, "You're going to not take an extra." pair of shoes or extra purse, anything with you at all, you're going to receive from the people that you're helping. So trying to foster that kind of a giving, receiving atmosphere um, has been really helpful to us. It may change us forever. So this is where the dynamic of, of the body of Christ, the global church, uh, with where we're all related to each other spiritually, uh, we're able to help each other across different, um, you know, uh, uh, nationalities, uh, 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 languages, uh, location, all those things, and 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 connect and support each other, and especially during a time of crisis, that type of network and 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 mutuality is really really important. It seems like. Yeah. 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 Very good. Well, what um, uh, you know, just kind of thinking through um, uh, the future, what does it look like uh, as as far as reopening or or what that might look like. You know, one specific question that you could just answer real quickly is, is uh, what percentage of, of your churches uh, are, are, are people out of work right now? That's something that, that uh, you know, we're getting uh, employment numbers and we're seeing that unemployment in California uh, might hit 25%, uh, uh, you know, 20 to 25% we're seeing uh, uh, things nationally, but just taking a snapshot, how is, how is this hitting the immigrant uh, community? What percentages are you seeing? In my case, we're, I would probably say about 25%, which of course we have about 110 families. That's uh, close to 30 families, uh, 20, 25 plus. So yeah, it's a pretty good amount of our congregation. Uh, again, uh, uh, we are a Spanish speaking, but it's really multicultural. We have people from different nationalities but all Spanish speaking but uh, it, it's good to see them how they're helping each other I know that there's a family that's cooking every week and people who can pay pay for the food and people who can cannot pay it's okay I mean that is uh, something this is a professional chef from one of the most renowned probably restaurants in the area and so his meals are, <laughs> I would pay to, to get some of those meals. But, mm -hmm. you know, it's amazing how people are managing to do this. And some people are very, very generous when they see what he's doing and people who can't really pay for it, it's okay. He, I don't know, I can't even remember how many meals he cooks every Saturday. And just, uh, you know, just to bless people. But in the end, he says, I think I'm being more blessed than I, if I would have sold every plate. So God is just amazing. When you give, like Lynn says, there's time to give, time to receive. When you decide to give, there's no questions. You are going to receive probably more than you expected from God. And, and he does it through people. So uh, that to me, that, that's that been a very amazing thing, how God is working. But 25 plus families are the ones that probably laid off. Amaro, is, is that close? Yeah, in their case, I can say 30%, pretty close. 30% of the people uh, is working, and 70%, they don't have a job right now. Oh, wow. They don't, uh, yeah, it's very low. And, uh, but like Brother Hoyle said, we are trying to communicate each other, each other and try to, to let the people know where they can go to get a job. Yeah, even, you know, flowers, a couple days a week. So everybody is trying to connect the others, at least to, to get in some hours working. Yeah, but 30%, I think they have worked and 70%, they, they don't have work right now. Oh, okay. Linda, how do you see, uh, uh, how do you see churches coming back from this, especially immigrant refugee churches? What role do you think that they'll be playing as we go through the next year of uh, of, uh, of of managing this virus, of, of trying to mitigate it, trying to get through it, and then and then coming out of it? Um, what are you thinking about? Yeah, I, I honestly um, really don't have any predictions. I've just seen so many variety of predictions. Um, I think that um, one of the um, one of the 
problems we're going to have with immigrant communities that oftentimes there's denser housing, there's more people living together in a home, um, there's um, more people that have to use public transportation, which is crowded in order to get to work. And I, I think one of the big fears that I have is, is this is going to see second wave. I know already that there are populations that are being more affected by like African American populations are more affected. Um, sometimes they've just had a history of, of having of, of having some underlying health problems, like a high blood pressure, diabetes, whatever that makes them need to kind of hold up more. Um, I also see that there are many cultures are much more um, relational than ours own in terms of just wanting to be there and hug people. And you know, honestly, um, I, my Norwegian background means that I uh, I was raised in a family that nobody ever hugs, and I'm fine not getting hugs. <laughs> and um, and uh, but there's so many cultures where that you know children need people kiss on the cheeks and all of that. So all of those kind of things are going to affect. Um, kind of a, a second wave, I believe, and that's that's what I'm praying against and, and fearful of. Um, I'm, um, yeah, I'm just seeing. It. No, here we just. Uh, I, I was on a call today with uh, county leaders, and and just over the last couple of weeks, they've done some studies, and um, the uh, the Anglo or Caucasian population of the county is about 65 percent, uh, but. But uh, white people have about 35% of the cases. The Hispanic yeah. uh, population is about 30%, but they're about 65% of the cases. I, I don't have those numbers in front of me, so it's not exactly right. But but I know when I looked at them, they were flipped, yeah. uh, you know, you know, doubled. And there's just a lot of concern. Why, you know, um, is, is this happening? How do we get support? But it's for some of those reasons that you said, Linda, just as far as large families and close proximity, and and um, and then her hearing today that. Uh, uh, farm workers um, were 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 being uh, were having to leave their homes and and didn't have places to stay and things like that and so how we can get support yeah. you know um, in that type of situation. Yeah. Let me say one more thing though the honor shame culture I don't know if you know much about that but the honor shame culture um, so we have uh, some cultures that are much more um, community oriented how they think and how they make actions happen and 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 some that are not. Um, there's kind of the guilt and fear opposite, and they're more individualistic. And I think that one of the reasons that in San Francisco we were able to shelter in place and have it very effective, um, um, more effective than in a lot of places, and do it quickly and do it without a lot of resistance, um, is that the honor shame culture says that you do what's good for the community rather than what's good for the individual. And so we've seen that, and I feel like that that hopefully that can be an overlay that helps us for the future as well. Mm -hmm. So that's something that we can, you know, that we can learn, um, you know, uh, from others as far as how they, you know, they navigate these things. One of the things uh, early on, I think we might have talked about this in a call uh, that, uh, that we had er um, earlier, um, uh, Joel and uh, Homero, but, um, but, you know, there are, are some people, um, you know, from different situations, you know, refugee backgrounds, for example, who have had to flee uh, certain things, you know, you know, many who have come from Central America and, and, and have fled great difficulty, you know, to come here and have built lives here, uh, you know, and then the churches that have built up around them and the, and, and the immigrant pastors who, who are working with their folks have resources, have spiritual and emotional and relational resources to navigate difficult times that the rest of us can learn from and uh, draw from, you know, uh, what do you do when everything isn't going well? You know, what do you do when, when the things that you're used to uh, begin to dissipate? And, and so hopefully through these types of dialogues and sharing information and, and uh, sharing resources, we can all grow stronger together, you know, coming out of this. I, um, I hope that's a, a, a real benefit of this. So, that's great. Yeah. See, what something that's very interesting is that some of our people that come from other countries, they are professionals. You know, and I can't imagine how hard it must be when you're a attorney, when you're a teacher in your country, but you come here yeah. and you come to cut vegetables or wash dishes, right. and that's the way to earn your living. They're very educated people, right. but in their countries, they can't just uh, work in their profession. I mean, it's very hard. And we see, at least I see a lot of those stories of people, you know, who have had to start all the way from bottom, 
having finished their schooling. Uh, we have a couple of attorneys. Uh, the, that's what they used to do, but they come here. But amazingly, they're, they're happier with what they're doing now. But I, I, you know, it's difficult at the beginning to encourage those people you know, to start somewhere. I have a few that are, were doctors in Mexico, and now they come here and they have to start from scratch because uh, especially the language barrier. I have a very young couple coming from Peru. Uh, he just graduated from medicine in Peru, but he comes here and uh, now he has to start. Well, luckily he's, work, he's, he's managing a, a pharmacy with a young wife and they're both working there. But from that to being a doctor, that's, that's a big <laughs> gap. So encouraging those people you know, because they're very educated people as far as secular world, but uh, here is different. It's a little different, uh, and and they're gonna have. We encourage them to continue go school, study, go go to English school, and and who knows in, in a few years, who knows where you're gonna be. But it, it takes a lot because here you have to work a lot. You almost have to have two jobs, if not three, to survive with the kind of money that most of our people make. But Again, they're, they're surviving well. Uh, I worked for many years in the agriculture. I worked uh, cutting lettuce for many, many years, you know, so I understand the background. Uh, right now, they're treated a little bit better than we used to be treated in the 70s and 80s. <laughs> but uh, still, they, they, they do struggle. They do struggle, especially people who are contracted for six months. They come and uh, they come here, but now they have to be uh, you know, sheltered. They came to work, but now what do they do? They came to make money for the families. Uh, well, luckily, or I would say blessed uh, that, 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 that some of the companies take care of them, at least with housing and food. But um, six months are going to go by. The, uh, you know, the, the vegetables are going to be probably, I don't know what's going to happen strawberries and all this stuff and they're going to have to go back home after six months mm -hmm. probably with nothing in their pockets mm -hmm. that's going to be hard for some of those people so for agriculture um you know it's it's a really important for them to be able to to, to work to help all of us you know I'll be able to have the, the food supply. I, I know that there's a bill that we've been working on that is getting bipartisan support um, that would help create um, uh, immigrant visas uh, for nurses and for doctors um, uh, to be able to help uh, fill in the stopgap uh, or to help fill in the, uh, fill in, in the gaps for uh, where there's a need to supply for medical workers. And so, you know, the potential that's that perhaps some of those who've been trained in other countries could be able to get uh, uh, the ability to be able to work um, in uh, in the healthcare field is, is something that that senators are working on. I know. Although they might be needed in their own um, countries of origin as well, there might not be jobs even though they're needed. You know, right uh, right now there there are two groups of immigrants that I work with um, that are have a lot of people in the health profession. One is the people from Ethiopia. So a lot of people in our Ethiopian church actually work in the medical health field. And so they're, um, they're pretty fearful that, that they could come down and, and have a contagion among people from Ethiopia. And then the other is Filipino. You know, the, um, I remember, you know, 40 years ago, working with Filipinos um, in the intensive care unit of Kaiser Hospital. And that's still true. There are very large percentages of, of medical professionals, mostly nurses in California are Filipino, and there's fear among that community that they could actually uh, have something that runs rampant in con a contagion among those populations as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, um, the bill, I, I was just looking it up, um, that is a pot potential, uh, it's called the Healthcare, um, Healthcare, Healthcare Workforce Resilience Act because we have a major shortage of doctors and nurses and and one sixth of, of all of our healthcare workers in america are immigrants and uh and so you know i've been in, in places where my uber driver was a doctor from ethiopia but but he wasn't able to get a license and even though you know here legally and, and everything but just wasn't able to practice medicine so um you know the bill is talking about bringing in uh healthcare workers as immigrants but uh, but you know also just recognizing those who are already here who haven't been able to practice in their in their 
you know, in their trained fields. Um, so, you know, it, it, it's just things like that as we work together, as we can, as we share and as we contribute together, there are possibilities for how, how we can help each other, you know, so. Um, well, uh, uh, I kind of running uh, uh, up against time, and I, I want to be uh, uh, cognizant of, of your time. And uh, I just thank you very much for the work that you're doing and the way that you're leading your churches. And it's been a pleasure to get to know you uh, throughout you. this. So, um, again, thank you for what you're doing. I really appreciate you. uh, what you're doing, and uh, uh, we'll be praying for you. Uh, and I know you'll be praying for us too. Absolutely. And thank Pastor, you for what you do, Linda. Thank you for what Linda does. I, I mean, I, I'm just always uh, impressed and amazed with what she does. I don't know where she gets the time to do all that she does. <laughs> God bless you, Linda. Thank you too, both of you very, very much. I just had an idea, actually. Um, these people that are like doctors in their own country or have these other jobs, I wonder if you could get some of them to do some online outreach workshops or something for you like about health or whatever in Spanish, whatever their area of expertise is, could they actually do an outreach work that you advertised to the Latino community? Yes, definitely. That would be good. Thank you. Thank you. Well, before I stop uh, recording, uh, Pastor uh, Amaro, could you pray uh, uh, for us and also pray for the immigrant and refugee churches that are, 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 are perhaps going through a little bit of a different experience than, than those who are, who are native born? Sure, sure. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for this time that you give us to service better to the families, to the people, especially to share the gospel with them. And thank you for all you're doing in every church with every pastor. Thank you because you're using uh, our lives to, to share the love, to share your love. And thank you for this opportunity to help the people, not only the Christian families, but also other people that they don't know you. Yes. And we pray for your help. We pray for your support that you can give us love and uh, give us all those resources, ideas, uh, the power that we need to keep going, ministering these people. And, and blessing God, our families, blessing our churches, blessing uh, our pastor, Alan Cross, Joel Jimenez, Linda, with these uh, uh, ministries. And, and thank you, Father. Thank you because you have a purpose and, uh, and we are in your hands. So we pray for, uh, give us all we need to keep going, doing our service and our job in every community. And thank you, thank you for our, for use our lives. And thank you for everything that you're doing right now. In, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen, amen. amen. Appreciate well, all of you. Thank you for who you are, what you do. Yeah, that's right. Well, thank you very much.